The current trend in 5G communications development has us building on the system of relying on long-range base station transmissions. The issue with this topology is that obstacles commonly block or attenuate these outgoing signals and hinder coverage. The installation of what are called 5G small cells are being considered in order to achieve the higher throughput of data and better coverage, especially around cities where obstacles are found in high density. These small cells act as a communications bridge to our devices, and city planners must decide carefully where to place these structures and how high they need to be for optimal coverage. We can readily demonstrate the simulation of such a scenario in the ANSYS electromagnetic tools using this small-scale city model, in which perhaps some parkgoers in this town square might seek coverage via a carefully placed 5G small cell. We'll build and optimize the antennas using ANSYS HFSS toolkits and integrate them in the scene to understand how effectively we can assemble small cells in larger scale models. We'll start off in the ANSYS electronics desktop and use the HFSS antenna toolkit to design our antenna. Now to design our cell antenna, we're going to stick with a very simple topology. We'll use a patch antenna array, and we'll see we have a number of options. We'll stick with the rectangular probe patch antenna. And we could see from the diagram below, it's a fairly simple topology, very flat, very easy to manage regarding real estate. So everything we'll see here today will be centered at five gigahertz. So we'll change the center frequency to five gigahertz and click the synthesis button. And we'll see that all of the dimensions of this antenna will be scaled accordingly. We click the finish button and our project will automatically be created for us. Now once that process completes, we can close our extension, and make our project a little bit bigger. We see here that we have a free space antenna, which we'll have to change. Now the first thing we notice is that some of the boundary conditions are actually obscured. We can correct this. So let's show that boundary. We could see clearly that this is a single free space antenna, and we're gonna change this because we want a small array. So the first thing we're going to do is take our radiating surface, adjust the padding so that this actually hugs the sides of the antenna as we're going to have additional elements padding around this antenna. And we'll have to assign a specific boundary condition to model the periodic nature of this antenna. So what we're actually going to be using is a coupled boundary condition, which we call a lattice pair, formerly known as a master-slave boundary. What this will basically do is mimic a hall of mirror effects in which this model will basically see additional antenna elements and on either side in the x and y direction of this antenna. Now with that done, we can actually take a look at our boundary conditions. We have a few that came with the antenna itself. We have an absorbing boundary condition, and we have our periodic boundary conditions that signals to the solver that this will be an infinite array simulation. So now with that, what we can do is really quickly adjust some dimensions. So if we click the design, we'll see that we have a number of variables predefined by the toolkit itself. So I can very easily uh, do design studies. and We don't even need to parametrize this ourselves. So the very first thing I want to do is actually make the footprint of this a bit smaller. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change the substrate size. So let's reduce the x dimension a little bit. Let's reduce the y dimension a little bit. And now we can see that we can fit more of these patch elements in a smaller space. This is going into something like a cell phone or a tablet after all. And now without any other adjustments, let's just take a look at how this antenna performs. So we'll fire off the existing analysis, make a very small change in which we delete a sweep that we don't need, and run that. And we'll get to see exactly what the return loss and radiation pattern looks like for this. Now once that simulation is complete, we can actually take a look at the profile and see that this took about 59 seconds to run in total, so not very long. More importantly, we can start by taking a look at the return loss for this antenna, and we can see immediately that it's really not resonating exactly at 5 GHz where we want. So there's a little tuning and optimization required for this antenna. And this is no surprise, we did after all modify the boundary conditions and the size of the antenna. So what we want to do is take a look at running a quick optimization. So what I'll first do is take a look at the design parameters and decide exactly which ones I want to sweep. So for this example, what we're going to do is go to the optimization radio bubble, 
and decide on modifying the patch dimensions themselves, which will of course change the center frequency, will change the substrate height, will also adjust a few of the feed dimensions, in this case the physical location of the feed in the x and y direction, and the length of the probe feed, and we'll just stick with those six variables for now. So commonly when I have a large number of variables, I'm interested in running more of a random search optimization, especially when I don't know that I'm close to a nominal position. So what we'll do is we'll add an optimization and choose a genetic algorithm, which is a random search. Now we have to set up our goal for optimization. This is going to be very simple. We're just going to use the center frequency, so the 5 gigahertz point, and optimize the return loss in that antenna. So here we'll see that we have the S parameters, S11 and dB, and under calculation range, we of course just have 5 gigahertz and using that adaptive frequency. So we click to add that calculation, choose a condition of being less than or equal to, let's say, about negative 15 dB. So hopefully this optimizer can get that center frequency down below at least 15 dB. So with that complete, we're actually good to go. We can click OK and fire off this optimization, and hopefully we should get some good generations that show us some good results. Now, once the optimization completes, we can take a look at the results. What we'll see is the cost function plotted against the number of iterations run, and we can see on this linear scale that it somewhat slowly drifts downwards as more generations are run. Now, if we wanted to interpret this a little better, we might want to use a log scale, and when we do that, we can see a number of spurs or more optimal generations that are arrived at. Now it's possible I could have run this for a shorter time frame and used one of these earlier spurs, but since I ran it for so long, we could see that we clearly have a minimum. So what we'll do is we'll add a marker just to see which iteration that is, and I could see it's number 344. So if we go into our table and scroll down, we could actually go to iteration 344, and when we highlight it, we can see all of the dimensions of our variables and the cost, and we can apply that to our design and actually take a look at some of these results. So now when I look at the return loss of the optimized design, we could see clearly that it's actually minimized at 5 gigahertz as designed. Now with this optimization complete, I'll do one more step before I actually create my array. I'll take this full design and create a 3D component with it. This actually lets me reuse this component in a number of applications if desired. I could even encrypt it too if I wanted to protect some of the geometry and share this model later. Now I've created a separate design in the project to hold the explicitly modeled array. And since we've created that 3D component, we can easily add this to the project. Once we add it, we'll see all of the dimensions, which is for the optimized design. We'll hit OK and that component should pop up in the window. Now, since we're using a 3D component, I can actually leverage a newer HFSS feature, which is the 3D component array. So with that 3D component placed and with those master and slave boundaries defined, I can actually right-click on model and choose create array, and it immediately knows exactly what I want to do. It wants to take that 3D component and extend it in two different directions. Now for this example, I'm going to create a 4x4 16 element array. Once we click visible, we'll eventually see exactly how this array is constructed. So here I'll choose to use just the one 3D component and place it in each of these index locations to create my 16 element array. Now note, if I wanted to, I could actually use multiple 3D components. For example, if I wanted different elements for the edges of this array, I can use a second 3D component and designate it in these edge locations, but for now I'm just going to use the exact same element across this array. Now when we hit apply, we'll see the array is generated. The benefit of doing this is that HFSS will actually mesh these 3D components separately and stitch together a non-conformal mesh to create the full field solution. With that complete, we just have to make sure our solution setup is being solved at 5 gigahertz, and we could go ahead and run that and start looking at radiation patterns of the full array. Now in leveraging the 3D component array feature, I saw pretty significant gains in both simulation time and RAM, and this solved in about 9-10 to 10 minutes on my 8GB RAM laptop with 4 cores. 
So once complete, we can take a look at the radiation pattern, and we can see a predictable phased array radiation pattern with a strong main lobe. And here we're seeing a max gain of about 18 dB. Now if we wanted to, we could superimpose this on the actual geometry and see how the radiation pattern looks relative to that geometry. At the same time, we could also look at field data. I could take a look at the electric field magnitude across the array elements, and we could even animate it to see how it changes with phase. With this, we have a good idea of how the electric field might change with respect to time across the array. With the antenna array designed and optimized, we can now place it in a larger problem. I've pulled in a CAD model of a city square into ANSYS space claim, and in this we can simplify it. Notably, I've converted a lot of the 3D objects to 2D CAD surfaces, which is what we'll need to use in the ANSYS Electronics Desktop Solver. Now in the Electronics Desktop, I could either import a step file from SpaceClaim or any number of MCAD formats, or I could use the more nifty route of going to this model tab and connecting to an existing SpaceClaim session, which will pull in the full geometry and create a two-way link between the two tools. We could see here we now have a space claim model that represents the full problem scene. What I've also done is I've created coordinate systems where each of the antennas will be placed. We could see these as antenna 1, which would be the cell phone, and antenna 2, which would be the 5G small cell. So what this represents is perhaps someone carrying a small device and trying to connect to the space station. Now in order to add these antennas, what we'll do is under excitations, we'll create an antenna component and actually link it to our array design. So we could see here that we could very easily select this array design which held our antenna array and add the antenna this way. If we take a look at the boundary conditions, we could see I've added materials for the buildings, the doors, the grass around the park, the concrete streets, and all of the windows of these buildings. The final setup to note is that I've actually created a variable that parametrizes the placement of the 5G cell antenna. If we go to our design, we can see I have a height variable, and if I change that, we can see that the radiation pattern for the base station antenna is actually moving, and it's parametrized in such a way that direct line of sight is achieved between these two antennas. And what makes this study very interesting is that if we try to rotate this model such that we see a line of sight, it's actually questionable as to whether or not it achieves it, given the presence of these buildings. For example, if I lowered this height, we could see that it's fathomable that we won't have a direct line of sight. So it's very close, and it makes for a very interesting antenna-to-antenna -antenna link study. So we're going to run a parametric study that I've set up, in which I've swept the height of that base station antenna from 3 meters all the way up to 10 meters, and we'll get to see how that antenna-received signal strength actually changes. Now we can solve a problem of this size using the ANSYS SBR Plus solver in just a few minutes per design iteration. And once we do that, we can take a look at things like the morphed radiation pattern when you factor in the building. So we could see here the radiation pattern changes substantially when we factor in all the reflections off the building, the town square, the ground, etc. We can also take a look at the insertion loss for each height of the base station antenna. And now from this, we can start to see more optimal heights at which we might have to place this antenna, and whether or not perhaps we have to shift it in the x or y direction. Now the final output that we might look at is a visual ray trace to see if we can understand where there might be dead spots in the outgoing radiation of this 5G antenna. In this ray trace, I can picture exactly how many bounces it takes for these rays to actually reach our antenna, and we can start to see dead zones in this town square, in which perhaps the signal that finally reaches our receiving antennas will be heavily attenuated. This may give us a good idea of exactly where we need to place this 5G small cell in order to achieve adequate coverage of this town square. With this workflow in the ANSYS Electromagnetic Suite, city planners and antenna designers may continue to plan ahead and successfully integrate 5G technology in everyday life.